So I'm going to talk today about mTOR, and I'm going to put it right in the middle, and it's going to be really big. <clears throat> that's all I'm going to talk about. Um, so actually, I'm going to talk about rapamycin, which is an inhibitor of mTOR, and um, some of what I think are the interesting and exciting uh, developments where we're actually starting to see some, some clinical evaluation of rapamycin. But I'm going to start with, with a little bit of background just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, and <clears throat> it's useful, I think, to recognize... So rapamycin is an inhibitor of mTOR. mTOR stands for mechanistic target of rapamycin, but mTOR itself, which is a kinase, functions in two different complexes, mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2. And for the biology of aging, I would say the vast majority of the evidence supports the idea that it's really mTOR complex 1 that seems to be most important for mediating aging, longevity, a variety of health span metrics, and <clears throat> in particular, when you reduce mTOR complex 1 activity, either genetically or pharmacologically with something like rapamycin, across a wide range of organisms. In fact, every organism where it's been tested, as far as I know, you see increased lifespan, and to the extent that we can measure health span in these different organisms, improved health span. So, <clears throat> again, very general idea, turning down mTOR1 is good for longevity. There's some evidence that turning up mTORC2 may be good for longevity, or maybe I should say it differently, that inhibition of mTORC2 can be bad for longevity, at least in mice, although it's a little bit complicated in worms where there's some, some contradictory evidence to that. So I'm not going to worry about mTORC complex 2. Um, <clears throat> the other point I want to make is rapamycin, which is kind of small in this graphic here, it's right here, is a specific inhibitor of mTORC complex 1. Um, it's one of the cleanest drugs biochemically you're ever going to find. And, it, and it's, in part, it's so clean because it's a very specific allosteric inhibitor of mTOR complex 1. So rapamycin actually binds this protein, FKBP12, and it's that complex that goes and inhibits mTOR complex 1. And as far as I know, there aren't any biochemical off-target effects of rapamycin. Getting back to make it a little bit more complicated, though, if you have strong inhibition of mTOR complex 1, prolonged, you can get inhibition of mTOR complex 2. And there's this idea that that sort of chronic inhibition of mTOR complex 1 leading to inhibition of mTOR complex 2 accounts for some of the side effects of rapamycin that I'll come back to. Okay, last thing I'll say on this graphic, you'll see there's lots down here, and if we put that whole big network model in here, you'll, you would see that mTOR talks to FOXO and AMP kinase and AKT and sirtuins and... And so there are, there's a lot going on when you inhibit mTOR complex 1. And um, generally speaking, I think for, for effects on longevity, we still don't really know which of the downstream effects are most important, right, for how mechanistically how rapamycin or inhibition of mTOR1 is affecting all of the different stuff that, that, that it does in the context of aging. I think people will often point towards autophagy. We heard some in this meeting about translation. Lipids, of course, are important. They're, they're, energy metabolism is sort of a catch-all, but rapamycin and mTOR regulate mitochondrial function. Big effects on inflammation. So how all of those downstream processes are interacting to, to account for what we see when we knock down mTOR complex 1 um, is still, I think, a really... Uh, unclear and important area of future research. So I want to talk for a minute about um, types of mTOR inhibitors, because again, there's a lot of confusion uh, when I talk to people in the field about this. So there are three classes of mTOR inhibitors shown here. There are rapamycin and rapamycin-like molecules, which are collectively referred to as rapalogs. Those all have the, exactly that same allosteric mechanism that I mentioned, where they bind FK, FKBP12 and inhibit mTOR complex 1. And they're all specific for mTOR complex 1. So if you've heard of everolimus or temserolimus or RAD001, which is also everolimus, those are all rapalogs. And I think it's fair to say you can think of them as exactly like rapamycin. They have slightly different pharmacokinetics and, and bioavailability. But biologically, biochemically, they work just like rapamycin. And that's very different from the other two classes, which are uh, ATP competitive inhibitors. So they are going in the active site and inhibiting mTOR that way. The most important thing to appreciate is these other types of inhibitors will inhibit both mTOR complex 1 and mTOR complex 2. Uh, so there are relatively nonspecific uh, 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 ATP competitive mTOR inhibitors. Some are called these dual kinase inhibitors. I'm going to highlight this one here with NVP-BEZ-235. I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
That's the drug that Restorbio developed in their clinical trials, and in particular in their third clinical trial, which I'll come back to, for uh, enhancing immune function in the elderly. So that actually was not a rapalog, and I think that's important to appreciate. And then, there, and, and these are um, hitting other kinases, right? So that's also important. They're not specific for mTOR. Uh, and then there are more specific mTOR ATP competitive inhibitors like TORIN-1 and TORIN-2. Okay, again, though, those are hitting both TOR complex 1 and TOR complex 2. And I go through all of this because I don't think most people in the field appreciate we have almost no information about the effect of ATP competitive mTOR inhibitors on aging. It is a huge gap in the literature, and it's, it's actually kind of embarrassing for the field, I would say, that we haven't looked at these because they might have really interesting effects. Okay. So uh, this is just kind of showing my sort of simple-minded view of, of how mTOR complex 1 is affecting aging. So uh, it's important to appreciate that uh, mTOR complex 1 is sort of a central decision maker in the cell. It senses the external environment or helps the cell sense the external environment and then make a decision. Is it a good time to grow, divide, reproduce? And the primary thing, not exclusively, but the primary thing that mTOR complex one is sensing are nutrients uh, in the form of amino acids. Although I think we're learning that it's not solely amino acids that mTOR complex one is sensing that, that glucose and, and lipids uh, also play a role in regulating mTOR complex one. But Particularly, branch chain amino acids are, and leucine are very potent activators of mTOR complex 1. So high nutrient levels, high mTOR complex 1 activity, high growth and division. Rapamycin is sort of the opposite of that. So you can think of rapamycin in some ways as tricking the cell or the organism into thinking that there isn't very much food around, right? There's not a lot of nutrients. And as I mentioned, <laughs> there's a lot that mTOR complex 1 regulates that could be contributing to the biology of aging. And I'm showing the hallmarks here because... Another thing I think it's useful to appreciate is there's pretty clear evidence in the literature that when you genetically knock down mTOR complex 1 or pharmacologically with rapamycin inhibit mTOR complex 1, you have effects on all of the hallmarks of aging. And I think, again, that's really just telling us that there's this network of interacting longevity factors, right, or proteins that um, modulate the biology of aging in some centrally fundamental way that seems to impact many or all of the hallmarks of the aging simultaneously. Okay, so uh, about rapamycin, I'm sure you all are aware it was uh, discovered on Rapa Nui or Easter Island. Um, it comes from a soil bacteria there, um, and it's also been FDA approved for more than 20 years. So it was first approved to prevent organ transplant rejection, and that's why you'll hear it referred to as an immunosuppressant. I'll come back to that. It's a little bit unclear if it's a true immunosuppressant, but that's how it's been used clinically. Um, and so that's important. It means we've got a lot of information about effects of rapamycin on human beings. It's also important because the way it was developed has led to sort of a bad reputation for rapamycin because it's really almost exclusively been used in organ transplant patients taking high doses of the drug and also taking strong immunosuppressants. And there are side effects in that context. And I'll come back to that. Um, so, uh, so this is why I say rapamycin is the gold standard for a pharmacological intervention to affect aging. It is by far the most effective longevity drug in terms of absolute effect on lifespan in mice. It also extends lifespan in yeast and worms and flies. It affects many, many aspects of health span. Uh, some of the tissues affected are shown here. And it works for everybody. And I think anyone in this field can appreciate that's not often the case. <laughs> so there's no argument about mTOR or rapamycin. Um, the other thing I'll say is What's one of the one of the nice pieces of evidence that this is this is a real and robust effect is you can do exactly the same thing with genetic inhibition of mTOR in each of those model organisms and get exactly the same effects. So this really is rock solid. Um, a couple of other things about rapamycin that I think are particularly important, though, is that in mice at least you can start the treatment in middle age and basically, apparently, at least for lifespan, get most or all of the benefits that you get from starting at young age. Okay, and for something that we might want to consider moving into the clinic, um, that's important. Uh, and then again, you know, as I mentioned, it's not just affecting lifespan. I think some people will say, well, it's all because of cancer, right? We've heard that about caloric restriction too. Certainly in the case of rapamycin and caloric restriction, we see improvements in function in multiple tissues in the context of aging. And, and in several cases, we can actually see uh, a reversal of age-related functional declines. And that's pretty, um, pretty exciting. And I'm going to just talk about four. I'll talk about two in a little bit of detail, but these I think are the places in mice 
where it is uh, most apparent that you can take an old mouse where you've already seen a decline in function and actually reverse that functional decline in an old mouse with somewhere between four and uh, eight weeks of rapamycin treatment. So that's true in the heart. I'm not going to talk about the heart anymore other than to say that three different labs now at least have shown you can rejuvenate heart function in an aged, mice, aged mouse with rapamycin. Um, I'm also not going to talk anymore about uh, ovarian function, but this is sort of an emerging area. So I went to the Reproductive Aging Conference in Palm Springs, I don't know, five or six weeks ago. And I think there were three different talks, maybe four talks, all around inhibition of mTOR and restoration of ovarian function um, with some really pretty remarkable pictures where you actually have an old mouse, you can see this atrophied ovary, and you take an old mouse that's been treated with rapamycin and it's, it looks you know, like a young ovary. So, um, so I think you're going to hear more about this, and then I'll talk about a clinical trial that's, that's being started to look at this in people. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit more about immune function and uh, oral health just very briefly because I think it's useful to go through the data and actually appreciate how, how, uh, it, how strong some of these effects are. So um, this is from a paper from Pan Zheng's lab. It was published actually back in 2009, so it's a pretty uh, old paper at this point. If you've never read this, I'd really encourage you to. This is, this is one of my favorite uh, papers. So um, what they were looking at was the, the, trying to understand the mechanisms for how the immune system ages in a mouse and then what, uh, what role does mTOR play in that process. And so this data is specifically looking at uh, influenza uh, vaccine vaccination and the efficacy of an influenza vaccine um, in the context of aging. So uh, what's shown here is survival after a lethal, what would be a lethal challenge with influenza in a non-immunized mouse. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's this control right here. So these are young mice that were not immunized and you can see once they're challenged with influenza, they're all dead within a little bit more than a week. Um, whereas a young mouse that is immunized is up here, okay, so completely protected. So that makes sense, right? A vaccine's going to work. It's going to do its job in a functional immune system, and the mouse would be protected. So the first piece of, I think, really interesting data um, is what happens if you're an old mouse and you're immunized, okay? So nothing to do with rapamycin, right? It's just a control, vehicle control treated old mouse. That's this dotted line here. So there's about a 70% chance that you're going to, your immune system, if you're an old mouse, is not going to respond to the vaccine and you will die from influenza just like a non-immunized young mouse. So clearly a pretty big deficit in immune function in an aged mouse. So what happens if the old mouse gets six weeks of rapamycin treatment? Um, that's hidden up here behind the solid dot. There's a dotted line underneath the solid line. Those are aged mice that got six weeks of rapamycin then they got the vaccine, okay? Completely restored the ability of the aged immune system in a mouse to respond to a flu vaccine, completely protected. So, um, so this is pretty, I thought was, was pretty exciting, right? It suggests that you can take a non-functional immune system and make it functional again, at least defining function by ability to respond to a flu vaccine. And then this is a study that we published uh, from my lab a, a few years ago now, a couple years ago. This is work that was really pioneered by uh, John Ahn. Uh, he was a, a grad student in my lab, a DDS PhD. So he already, had his, he already had his dental degree when he came to me and he did his PhD. And, um, you know, I remember he comes in my office and he's like, you know, periodontal disease is an age-related disease. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he said, so they, they showed me the data, and it, and, and it looks like about two-thirds of people over the age 65 will develop periodontal disease. And if you look at incidence of disease as a function of age, it looks a lot like dementia, heart disease, cancer. And, and so together, we sort of appreciated that, well, that's, maybe there's an, there's an interaction here between the biology of aging and risk of developing periodontal disease, just like all these other age-related diseases, and maybe we could study that. So that was really what John pitched to me. He's now an assistant professor at the University of Washington, and the first thing that he did was ask, can we, can we see naturally occurring periodontal disease in aging mice? The answer was yes, and um, we defined that based on the, the clinically defining features of periodontal disease that you see in people, so uh, gingival inflammation, loss of bone around the teeth, and pathological uh, remodeling of the oral microbiome. 
And so, so once we knew we could, that mice naturally develop periodontal disease, we could ask the question, like in the study from Pen Jing's lab, what would rapamycin do? Would it have any effect on this naturally occurring process, aging process in mice? And it turns out eight weeks of rapamycin treatment was enough to reverse all three of those clinically defining features of periodontal disease. And so I'm not going to take you through all the data because this is published, but it was very striking. And one of the things that I thought was most striking, actually there are two things. One is shown here. We could actually see regrowth of bone after eight weeks. So we, we would, uh, John would anesthetize the mice, give them a micro CT, and then treat them and then come back and, and sacrifice. So you can actually see this pocket here in, in the untreated mouse before that has filled in with new bone afterwards. Um, so that was pretty exciting. The other thing that was striking to me was in both the periodontal bone and the gingival tissue, we saw this massive inflammatory response with age. It in fact, it looks a lot like the canonical SASP and rapamycin just knocked it down all the way back down to youthful level. So again, that's all published if you're interested, but, um, but this is now a second uh, or third or fourth uh, different part of the body where we can see functional rejuvenation with rapamycin in an aged animal. And I don't want to give the impression that, that it does that everywhere. We know it doesn't. Rapamycin does not make an old mouse into a young mouse. But in multiple tissues, we can apparently restore function, which is, I think, pretty exciting if that's possible you know, outside of the laboratory. And then this is another study that Alessandro Vito uh, published when he was a postdoc in my lab where we asked a very simple question, which is, you know, what happens if we take an old mouse and we treat it with rapamycin for, for 12 weeks, and then we don't do anything else. We just put them back on the shelf and let them live out the rest of their natural life. And it turns out that you can get pretty robust lifespan extension. So this is, this is one cohort. We did it in males and females in a couple different doses. Again, it's published if you're interested. Uh, this was the highest dose we tested, and this, these are male mice. And you can see that... Um, from the end of the treatment period, which now these mice are 23 to 24 months old at the start here, uh, you get about a 60% increase in life expectancy from just a 12-week uh, treatment. Um, sort of interesting that the, the absolute magnitude of extension here is longer than the length of time that they saw the treatment, and it's interesting to think about what type of biology would do that. Um, and obviously no idea whether this will work in people, or if it does, would it be really a linear extrapolation? But if we just if we just take that as a possibility, that's about two decades for a typical 50-year-old woman. So potentially pretty significant effects on life expectancy. Okay, so hopefully you will believe that short-term transient rapamycin treatment in mice has some um, pretty interesting and exciting effects. Um, so why aren't we all taking it, right? Well, some of us might be, but... Um, I think there's, there's obviously good reasons. First of all, we don't know <laughs> that rapamycin is going to work the same way in people. Um, but I already alluded to the fact that it's got sort of a bad reputation among clinicians because of the way that it was developed as an immune uh, modulator, right, as in, to prevent organ transplant rejection. And again, in that context, in those patients, there are some side effects associated with rapamycin. And so if you talk to your you know, general physician, if they even know what rapamycin, well, first of all, they're they're not going to know what rapamycin is because it's called serolimus in the clinical community. Um, but if they did, if they knew that, they would probably think of organ transplant patients and say, it's an immunosuppressant. It's going to have all sorts of side effects. You're crazy if you think about taking rapamycin or serolimus. Um, so the, there's a, there is a reputation problem that I think needs to be addressed, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, um, how we're starting to try to do that. Um, but it's going to be an uphill battle. And I think it's a question still, how safe is rapamycin, can it be taken safely by people who are not organ transplant patients taking lower doses of the drug? Um, it's off patent, so like I said, it was approved I think 20 some years ago, so there's very little uh, uh, financial incentive for companies to develop rapamycin um, uh, because any physician can just prescribe it. There are a few rapalogs being still developed, but not many, not as many as you might expect given the, the interesting biology here. Um, we all know this is not specific to rapamycin. This is true for every intervention that anybody in the field is thinking about. There really isn't a clear path to regulatory approval for targeting aging. So you have to think about what are the right endpoints that you could actually do a clinical trial to get approval. So that's, that's a barrier more generally. Um, and I think this is one that I talk about, and actually, I think I talked about this at, at, at uh, the longevity therapeutics meeting, um, that in, in general, physicians are risk averse, right? They w don't want to do any harm. They're, it's hard to have a conversation and convince a, many physicians 
that we should be preventively trying to target aging to keep people healthy because first of all they don't appreciate that aging is modifiable and they're generally not um, comfortable prescribing medications to healthy people. So I, t I said that, and I, I just said it again, obviously. And Nir told me that I upset several people in the audience who were MDs because a PhD really shouldn't be talking about this. Um, but I'm going to keep talking about it. So if, if there are any MDs in here who are upset, I'm sorry, but deal with it. Um, now, I think it is a real problem that, uh, I don't know if it's a problem, it's a cultural thing that we are going to have to have a, an ongoing conversation with the clinical community about. Okay, so how do we start to do this then? How do we start to have that conversation? How do we start to gather data um, to understand, specifically in the case of rapamycin, how effective is it going to be uh, outside of the clinic? Um, uh, sorry, outside of the laboratory. So there are a variety of approaches that are, that are being taken. This is one, this is my dog, his name is Dobby. Um, where we are actually starting to ask the question, does rapamycin have any effect on the biology of aging in companion animals living with their owners? This is part of the Dog Aging Project. Uh, if you're interested, the website is here. I don't have time to tell you a lot about the Dog Aging Project. It's a very large, uh, mostly longitudinal study of aging, the goal of which is to understand genetic and environmental determinants of healthy aging in pet dogs. Um, but we do have a clinical trial, which I'll tell you a little bit more about, where we're trying to detest whether rapamycin can impact aging in companion animals. So this is just the structure of the Dog Aging Project. I just show this to give you a feel for how large the project actually is. We have more than 40,000 dogs now where we have uh, detailed owner survey-based data on their environment, health history. Uh, many of those, I think about half, we have electronic medical records. Then there are different sampled cohorts that I don't really have time to tell you about. The precision cohort is the systems biology cohort where we get um, uh, epigenome, metabolome, microbiome annually on those dogs uh, in addition to DNA sequencing. So what I am going to tell you more about though is triad, the clinical trial, test of rapamycin in aging dogs. Um, and the goal is to try to answer the question, does rapamycin slow aging in companion dogs? And hopefully you understand the rationale for why we picked rapamycin from the first half of my talk. Um, so this is uh, kind of where we're at. These are actually three of the dogs who were in uh, our first safety trial, uh, Rascal, Mouse, and Sipowitz. Um, so we've had two safety trials so far. One was a 10-week treatment. One was a six-month treatment period. All double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trials. So I think the key take-home from those trials is down at the bottom are no significant side effects at all. Uh, the only thing we saw was one dog developed high triglycerides, and that's a known side effect of rapamycin in people. Um, uh, but as soon as the dog came off the rapamycin, it went away, and it was at the end of the treatment period anyways. But none of the dogs have gotten really sick. Nothing really bad has happened, so that's good news. Um, uh, both studies, the owners reported increased activity in the dogs taking rapamycin compared to the placebo. Remember, the owners didn't know. It was double blind. Um, and in the first study, we had some evidence for improved measures of heart function similar to what has been seen in mice. So it's very preliminary, but suggestive certainly that, that maybe rapamycin can have effects on heart. So the trial that we are carrying out now is pretty big. Uh, it's, it's extremely big by veterinary clinical trial standards. Uh, so 580 large, so uh, 40 to 110 pounds, middle-aged, so at least seven-year-old dogs. And that's because we need an old, older cohort in order to be powered to see changes, if there are going to be any, um, and because big dogs age faster than small dogs, so that's why we have the weight uh, category in there. Um, block randomized at each clinical site between placebo and rapamycin. This is the dose. Uh, the study length is one year of treatment with two years of follow-up, and at this size, uh, we believe we are statistically powered to detect a 9% change in lifespan, which is the lower end of what's been seen in mice. So lifespan is the primary endpoint for this study, which I think is really important because I, that's very rare, obviously, in, in clinical studies, um, uh, at least in a healthy population. Um, I guess that's the other thing I should say. Um, this is a healthy aging study, right? These dogs can't be sick in order to come into the study. So no pre-existing significant conditions, that's an exclusion criteria. Um, secondary endpoints, we're trying to look as broadly as we can at health span. So uh, the dog, the echocardiograms every six months, 
uh, the cognitive assessments every six months. We are measuring activity, looking at disease incidents, and, and really trying to look as broadly as we can at, at health. Um, and then exploratory endpoints are metabolome, microbiome, epigenome, things like that. This is the a schematic of the design again. Um, so the way it works, the dogs come into one of the partner clinical sites. We have nine veterinary teaching hospital clinical sites right now. We're expanding that. Hopefully we'll be up around 15 to 20 by the end of this calendar year. Um, so the dogs come in, they are pre-screened. If, if there's no pre-existing conditions, right, again, they can't be sick, they are randomized, enrolled and randomized. Uh, and then every baseline in every six months, we will get uh, echocardiograms on half the dogs, a little bit more than half. The, the dogs that don't get echocardiograms will get neurological exams. Um, and then we get uh, uh, microbiome, metabolome, blood chemistry, epigenome, cognitive assessments, activity, all that stuff I already talked about. Every six months, the dogs come back to the clinic for that entire three-year period, so seven visits for each dog enrolled in the trial. Um, this, is, this is outdated. This is my ambitious hope that we would have everybody in by the end of this year, but it'll probably be June of next year before we get up to the, the 580 um, goal. Okay, so I want to just now talk briefly about dementia. So this is a neurobiology of aging meeting, so I thought I should say something about the brain. Turns out rapamycin has really interesting effects on the brain as well, um, including like uh, things that I wouldn't have expected, like effects on autism and uh, combining rapamycin with, with medications that are often given for depression is an emerging area. So I think it goes beyond aging, the effects of rapamycin on the brain. But it, there's a whole body of literature, both for normative aging and for dementia models in mice, that rapamycin can um, improve outcomes. So we thought that it would be interesting to look at this in companion dogs again, because companion dogs do develop dementia. It's not Alzheimer's disease, but it, in some ways it looks like Alzheimer's disease. They do show some uh, neuropathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And the cool thing is that this can be diagnosed by questionnaire. So there are two clinically validated questionnaires for diagnosing um, canine cognitive dysfunction, or CCD. Um, and, and they've been used mostly as binary tools. So, and what I mean by that is that if the dog scores above a certain amount from this, the owner completed questionnaire, I think it's 40 or 50, that is diagnostic for dementia. And, it, and you know, with 95% accuracy or something like that, the results of the questionnaire will match what a veterinarian would um, uh, diagnose as dementia. So we have developed that questionnaire send it out to all of our owners. They get it every year. Uh, canine social and learned behavior uh, survey is what we call it. And we are now asking, can we use it as a continuous tool? No longer binary. In other words, can the survey predict cognitive dysfunction before dementia? Will we see increasing scores with age? Um, uh, and so it turns out it looks like it probably can. So these are the scores across uh, the cohort. I think there's about 20 maybe 25,000 uh, uh, dogs in this data set here, broke it out by weight range and sex. And I, the only thing really, the most important thing to appreciate is it's clearly age related. And this is all below the diagnostic threshold. Remember the diagnostic threshold for an individual dog to have dementia is 50, okay? So well below the diagnostic threshold, we are seeing a clear age related change in score with this survey. Um, so we're pretty confident that this can be used somewhat as a continuous tool. The other sort of interesting thing I'll just note, so for, I told you big dogs age faster than small dogs. For almost every other age-related functional decline or disease you look at, at the same chronological age, a big dog will be at higher risk and big dogs live shorter. There is no weight effect here at all that we can see. So that might suggest that aging in the brain is somehow different from aging in the rest of the body, and it's not so affected by the size component. And interestingly, the strongest genetic determinant of body size in dogs, anyone want to guess? IGF. IGF, yeah, right. So that this kind of might make sense with what we, what, what we have learned about brain aging and, and IGF and insulin signaling. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, so we are now collaborating with uh, Steph, Steph McGrath and Julie Moreno at uh, Colorado State University in a clinical trial, it's a small pilot clinical trial for now, to look at the effects of rapamycin and their interest in a couple of other interventions on dementia in dogs. So they are enrolling dogs with dementia into this trial. Uh, one of the groups will be rapamycin. Again, it's a placebo-controlled trial. 
two-year trial, exams every three months, and we'll actually get brain imaging in addition to you know, the blood-based markers that, that we're getting for all the other dogs. We'll also get CSF from these dogs. So again, it's a small trial, but I think it's going to be really interesting. And you know, maybe we'll see some signal there that, that suggests to us that we should expand this. Um, so I'm pretty excited to see how that study comes out. OK, so I'm just going to finish up now by talking about, instead of working in companion animals, this progression to trying to understand how does rapamycin affect aging and age-related outcomes in people through clinical trials. And I want to come back to this RestorBio story that I mentioned um, towards the beginning of my talk, because I don't think a lot of people in the field understand what actually happened here. So there have been three clinical trials, two phase twos and one phase three, for mTOR inhibition in healthy elderly people to determine what effect does that have on the aged immune system. So the two phase two clinical trials, which were published in um, 2014 and 2018, used Everolimus, which is a Rapalog, right? It's a derivative of Rapamycin. In the second study, they added in this uh, second drug, which is RTB101, which is that BEZ drug that I told you about before, that's an ATP competitive inhibitor of mTOR. So it's not a Rapalog. Um, so in both of those phase twos, they saw improvements in vaccine response in the people who got Everolimus, or in the second trial, Everolimus plus RTB101. So when they went to their pivotal phase three, the decision was made to take the Rapalog out and to only have the ATP competitive inhibitor in there. And I get the rationale for that. I know why they did it. I'm not criticizing them for that decision necessarily. But again, I think it's important to appreciate we have no data in animals on these ATP competitive inhibitors and aging and age-related phenotypes, right? So I would have felt more comfortable having a Rapalog in there. In any case, they went to their pivotal, took the Rapalog. But again, I think it's important to appreciate we have no data in animals on these ATP competitive inhibitors and aging and age-related phenotypes, right? So I would have felt more comfortable having a Rapalog in there. In any case, they went to their pivotal, took the Rapalog out. And um, the other thing that, that happened in that phase three was in the two phase twos, they could use laboratory confirmed infections as the endpoint. For some reason, the FDA decided that it would be better in the phase three to use patient reported infections. And if you guys think about that, that's, um, that's going to be noisier, I think, for sure, right? People feel sick all the time when they aren't. They don't feel sick when they aren't. Look, we all know people who've had COVID, no symptoms. They take the test. They're infected, right? So, but in any case, that was the end point that they, that they went with. Um, and they got halfway through, and they weren't hitting their end point. And so the, the board of directors shut the trial down. Um, that was November 2019. Um, so if you think about where the world went about five months later, and you might have a drug that could improve immune function in the elderly, Timing was unfortunate. And so Joan has actually gone back and done a, uh, an analysis now after the fact, looking at um, subsequent uh, severe infections in the people who are in this study. And again, remember, this was 2019. So it was before COVID-19. Um, and so this is published uh, in Lancet Healthy Longevity recently. And it's interesting, because not everything do you see in, uh, protection in the mTOR inhibitor group, the RTB101 group. But for coronavirus, which, yeah, interesting, uh, rhinovirus uh, and influenza, it looks like there's probably a pretty big effect in the people who got the mTOR inhibitor for only six weeks in subsequent severe outcomes over the next six months. And there's now accumulating clinical trial data, small clinical trials, that rapamycin um, might be pretty effective at blocking severe outcomes from COVID-19. So again, the timing was kind of unfortunate, um, but wouldn't it have been nice to have something early on that would knock down severe outcomes by, by 50%? Okay, so now we're here today. Uh, so, and, and I think it's just important to appreciate, go through how that all happened, because I don't think you can say that, the, the, that rapamycin didn't work because it wasn't in that clinical trial. So I, I think that's important to appreciate. Um, all right. So I think in the next couple of years, we're going to learn a lot. So I actually, this is probably outdated. There's probably closer to three or 4,000 people taking rapamycin off-label right now for health span promotion or for other, you know, non, not the indications that it's known to be used for. Um, so we are working on a project where we have now obtained survey 
uh, and we're working on medical and dental records from as, from, a, from as many of these people as we can. We've gotten about 500 completed surveys. We do have a control group, so people who've never used rapamycin. Um, uh, about two-thirds of our group are men. So this is not a, <laughs> there's lots of problems with this data set, right? This is all patient reported for the most part. Um, it's not a clean study, but I'm hoping that we can learn something about you know, how often do these people experience side effects? What, what is going on in this group? Um, and we've already got, I think, some really interesting case reports. So this is just a subset of the disorders where there are patients in our, in our study, or there are patients, I guess, in our study, but human beings taking rapamycin who have experienced what they describe as pretty profound improvements in their conditions for a variety of different conditions. Many of these actually make a ton of sense with rapamycin as well. So for example, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and dilated cardiomyopathy, there's pretty good data in animal models that rapamycin is very effective at knocking, at reversing those disorders. The other thing I'll say is a lot of these have uh, autoimmune components to them. And so that's where I really think we're most likely to see benefits of rapamycin in people are in autoimmune related conditions, which again, as you can probably all appreciate, is a big part of a lot of the, the the symptomatic components of aging, the, the, a lot of the stuff that people experience with, with age. Um, okay, so there are also now three clinical trials that I know of that are, that are starting up um, uh, for s specifically because of this geroscience sort of uh, idea behind rapamycin to see whether we can have impacts on age-related endpoints in people. So John, uh, John Hahn, who I mentioned, has a clinical trial funded by the Impetus Program for Periodontal Disease at the University of Washington. Um, I think they'll be enrolling in the next couple of months. They're just finishing up the, the, the IND with FDA because the, the formulation they're using is developed by this company, Trivium Vet. It's, in a, it's an enteric-coated form of rapamycin. Um, Brad Stanfield in New Zealand is raising funds for this study, so they've got the protocol approved to look at the effects of rapamycin plus exercise on muscle function in elderly people. And then uh, Zev Williams and Yushin Su at Columbia, also funded by the Impetus Grants Program, also using this enteric coated form of rapamycin, are looking at premature ovarian failure in women. And so, you know, again, hopefully these studies will start on track this year and um, maybe next year we'll have some, some ideas as to whether or not rapamycin is effective for these conditions. Okay, so for that, I'll stop, and uh, I'll be happy to take some questions.